to report, as she was able to report earlier on in that uh, interview, that her father's health is every bit as good as can be expected. And indeed, we have just heard from the uh, chief of clinical surgery at George Washington uh, Hospital uh, that there is every reason to believe that the president, by tomorrow, uh, will be able to make the decisions that are necessary for a president. Standing by now in our studios in New York is Dr. Dominic DeMeo. Dr. DeMeo is former chief medical examiner of the city of New York. And Dr. DeMeo, perhaps you can show us uh, on that, uh, what, what do you call that statue? Uh, it's a model, I guess. It's, it's a good a, model. It is a good model. Perhaps you can show us on that, now that you have heard the uh, medical briefing, uh, precisely what happened to well, the president. Well, according to the statements, the bullet entered just below the axilla, and in so doing, went in the downward uh, path and struck the top of the seventh rib, which may have lacerated one of the uh, intercostal arteries. Uh, and we do know that the greatest uh, amount of energy is lost by the bullet when it penetrates the skin and strikes an object such as a piece of bone. Therefore, the greater portion of the velocity was gone so that the bullet did not penetrate very far into the uh, lung substance and therefore the surgeons were capable of going within three to four inches to pick out the uh, fragment of bullet which I gather uh, is a 22 caliber bullet and the weight of the bullet would probably confirm that uh, it was 22 caliber the amount of blood lost doesn't matter since it's immediately replaced also may I say that the uh, I'm sure the lung was sutured and completely expanded. Therefore, the recovery should be very rapid, and he should have a complete recovery with no residual defects from the bullet wound. Dr. DeMeo, can you show us where did, the, uh, where did the bullet ultimately end up? The bullet ended within three inches. In other words, it would be, uh, if I turned this around, it would be somewhere in the medial aspect, which is closest to the heart. but it's within the lung substance. It did not go anywhere near the heart. Dr. O'Leary uh, explained, but perhaps you could show it to us, why it was that initially uh, the surgeons themselves believed that the bullet had actually come within one inch of the heart, and then later, as you now say, it, uh, they, they were able to determine that it was nowhere close. Well, um, a lot depends on the taking of x-rays. You take an AMP, you take a in other words, you take a, uh, an x-ray from front to back, back to front, a side x-ray and an oblique x-ray. And sometimes the appearance of the x-ray makes the bullet appear to be close to the heart. But when you go in, you'll find that the expanding and contracting lung uh, causes a defect and um, you, a misapprehension as to the exact site of the bullet, which he, as you probably now know, was nowhere near the heart. Now, <clears throat> Dr. O'Leary also pointed out that had it not been for the fact that it struck the, uh, the seventh rib, Wrong. possibly it, it might have done even less damage, which sounds kind of curious. One no. Would have thought that the uh, rib was, as a matter of fact, if you wish to get technical... Uh, no, I don't. Please don't. <laughs> okay, then we won't. Uh, the thing is that the bullet uh, uh, proceeds at a certain amount of velocity, and that velocity is decreased as it penetrates the skin and hits a solid object as bone. Therefore, the velocity was decreased and could not go deeper than what it did. If, if, by any chance, the bullet did not strike the bone and went through the intercostal space, then there was a good possibility that if that velocity was sufficient enough, it would go through the lung directly into the heart. All right, Dr. DeMeo, right. thank you very much yes. indeed for your expert uh, help to us. We're going to go now to uh, Bettina Gregory, who has a report, uh, a little background report, on the alleged assailant, uh, John Hinckley. So let's go now to that report by Bettina Gregory. Surrounded by agents, 25-year-old John Warnock Hinckley Jr. was led away to be questioned by police. Federal law enforcement officials say he has a prior record of one or two arrests. A former high school principal described him as, quote, a kid with a behavioral problem adding Hinckley was not a model citizen when he attended school in Evergreen, Colorado. He graduated from Highland Park High School in Dallas, Texas in 1973. 
One high school classmate told ABC News he was a very nice boy who belonged to the high school government club. In fact, no one we've contacted remembers Hinckley getting into any serious trouble until allegedly today. ABC cameraman Henry Brown was an eyewitness to the shooting. He was to my right. In the line with the camera? In the line with the cameras. Right up the he moved right up to the road to start firing. It's a white male with blind hair about, uh, I guess, about 5'11". Police and FBI agents swarmed around the Washington Hilton Hotel looking for more evidence of the shooting. But at the White House, Secretary of State Haig was asked what by now seems to be a familiar question. Was there a conspiracy or was this a, a lot? There are no indications of anything like that now, and we are not going to say a word on that subject right. until the situation clarifies, of course. Hinckley was whisked by motorcade from Washington's police headquarters where he was questioned for several hours this afternoon to the Washington field office of the FBI. At this hour, he's being interrogated there. A couple of notes on his family. His parents are well-to-do and they reportedly have homes both in Evergreen, Colorado and in Dallas, Texas. His father works for a small oil company and his parents belong to at least one country club. In fact, everyone who knows his relative says that John Warnock Hinckley Jr., the man in custody and suspected of the shooting, comes from a pretty good family. Gentlemen? Thank you, Bettina. Yes, we've just heard uh, from uh, FBI headquarters where uh, the suspect uh, is being interrogated. He has uh, been given a court-appointed lawyer. He's also requested the physician and has complained of a sore throat. Uh, we don't know anything more about the uh, nature of the interrogation. Uh, it was told uh, to us that uh, he's not being restrained in the, the sense that they seized him immediately after the assassination attempt this afternoon. And that's about all we know, although ABC News has learned, we have information that uh, this man, John Warnock Hinckley, was arrested in Tennessee last October during the campaign with three guns on him at the time near a rally for President Carter. And there is one other note, uh, that he was arrested on minor drug charges uh, in California on that. So apparently his, his record may not be Uh, Senator Dole is one of the senior Republican members, chairman of the Finance Committee, and was here all day today. Senator, where were you when uh, you got word that uh, the president had been shot or shot at? Well, I was on the Senate floor. One of my staff aides uh, whispered to me that there had been a shooting and that the president wasn't directly involved. So uh, I was on the Senate floor shortly after it happened. What were the first thoughts that ran through your mind when you heard that? Was that before Senator Baker had announced it formally? Uh, before Senator Baker announced it, well, I think it was some disbelief and uh, maybe uh, a bit of anger, but not really knowing what the facts were, uh, whether somebody had fired a shot in the air, actually hit someone, uh, a, a bit of confusion. So I walked around like everybody was, trying to obtain more facts, and you learned very quickly that it was serious. Then you felt very sad about those who had been, uh, had been directly involved, and even at that time, we were told the president only had a bump on his head. So we felt, from the standpoint of the president, the news was good. And what did you do then? I got a lot of senators flocked into the uh, cloakrooms and watched on television. Were you among them? I was there for a good hour, and then I drifted down to Senator Baker's office on the theory that he might pick up information uh, with a little more accuracy, because there's many conflicting uh, stories, and, and I guess there's some reason for that, with so many people reporting in. And I spent a couple of hours in Senator Baker's office, and he'd had a chance to talk with Senator Laxalt, and we were fairly well up to date before we went into the Senate and adjourned. Now, this is all rather depressingly familiar to those of us who have either watched public life or, as in your case, been in public life for so long. But how does this particular episode strike you? Well, I think it, it probably renews a lot of memories about other incidents uh, here, uh, and we don't know yet what this young man's motives were, if he had any motives. But apparently this firing at will uh, injured uh, three people seriously and one critically. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of outrage. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of hope for those who are directly involved. And beyond that, without knowing more about uh, the young man involved, it's hard to say. Senator, we've all seen that, that videotape, that awful videotape, mm -hmm. over and over again. And we see the president walk out now. 
This was a scheduled event. The uh, president was surrounded uh, by as many Secret Service agents as the professionals there uh, would have indicated that uh, were necessary. And in addition, there were a lot of staff people, District of Columbia police. Uh, this was not a, uh, a moment where he broke away from his security. And yet, for all that, uh, this has happened. It, it does suggest that uh, the future of uh, going out in public in American public life is, uh, is a little dim, doesn't it? Well, I think it demonstrates very clearly if somebody wants to do harm to anyone, whether it's a public official or a private citizen, and even the President of the United States, as much protection as he has, uh, they can do it. Here's a, a man who was within 10 feet, we're told, of the President, and probably within uh, 5 feet of uh, Jim Brady. Uh, there's no way you can protect against uh, someone like that uh, when they're that close. And how he infiltrated uh, in the press area, I don't know. But I bet there'd be a lot of tugging and hauling on the Secret Service in the next 30 to 60 days. Yes, I bet there will. Senator, thank you very much. Ted? Thank you very much, Brett. Perhaps it's time to bring everyone up to date on, on where we stand. Uh, it is possible, I suppose, it being 825 here on the East Coast, that some of you perhaps are just tuning in to see what's going to happen with the uh, Academy Awards. Those have been delayed for at least 24 hours. We are, uh, and have been, for almost six hours now on live coverage with uh, the aftermath now of the shooting that involved the President of the United States, who has come out very successfully after surgery, the President's press secretary, James Brady, who is in critical condition, Tim McCarthy, a U.S. Secret Service agent, who was also shot and is said to be in good condition, Thomas Delahanty, a District of Columbia Police Department uh, officer, uh, who was also shot and is said to be in serious condition at the Was Washington Hospital Center. The latest word that we have is that Nancy Reagan, who was at the hospital uh, waiting for uh, the result of surgery on her husband, the president, that she has now left the hospital, presumably returned to the White House. Uh, they had initially set up a room for her to spend the night at the hospital if she wanted to, but apparently the good report that she has received on the surgery involving the president, apparently the only thing that happened to him, serious enough, is that his lung was punctured by what appears to have been a 22 caliber bullet, but thankfully nothing beyond that. And the, uh, the doctors are saying that mentally the president is in extraordinary condition, that he should be able to make presidential decisions again by as early as tomorrow, uh, that possibly he will be able to leave the hospital within, what was it, Frank, a I couple of weeks? A couple of weeks, yes. But and that was just a guess to a surmise on the yes, side of the Yes, and should be back in, in completely recovered condition within two to two and a half months. So all things considered, things have gone about as well as they possibly could for the present. The, We'd like uh, to go now to the White House where our correspondent Susan King is standing by. Susan? Yes, uh, gentlemen, there have been some reports that Vice President Bush had landed on the South Lawn, the uh, typical place for the president, of course, to land after he returns from out of town, coming from Andrews Air Force Base. But in fact, the vice president refused to land on the South Lawn. He made it clear to all involved that he wanted to land at the Naval Observatory, where, of course, the vice president's home is. He was met there by the Ed Meese, who was the chief counselor to the president, who met him and his motorcade, and then they came down here stopped at the uh, hospital and then came to the White House where he was briefed and brought up to speed at the Situation Room where the Cabinet has been meeting all day. The Vice President made it clear to his staff that he did not want to have uh, to land on the South Lawn because of the symbolism, the fact that the President always stayed there and he wanted to be very clear cut at this time. The Vice President, if you just heard some noise behind me, the Vice President is coming down to brief reporters on the situation here. I understand that he was given uh, an option paper as he landed at Andrews Air Force Base with a few options on it, about a dozen, one being perhaps we should consider a cabinet meeting and congressional leadership. Here now is Larry Speaks. Uh, for your information, the Vice President landed at Andrews at 6.30. He came to the Situation Room at 7 o'clock, which he presided over a meeting of the, um, some members of the Cabinet. Uh, he will make a brief statement. I will not take questions, but I will follow and take some questions. All right, we're All waiting right. now for the Vice President out. to come in. Uh, I was under the same yeah. impression you were, Frank, that Larry Speaks was just about to introduce the I Vice President. There and indeed, there he is. Well, I have a very brief statement that I'd... Uh, would like to read. I am deeply heartened by Dr. O'Leary's report on the president's condition. 
that he has emerged from this experience with flying colors and with the most optimistic prospects for a complete recovery. I can reassure this nation and a watching world that the American government is functioning fully and effectively. We've had full and complete communication throughout the day and the officers of the federal government have been fulfilling their obligations with skill and with care. I know I speak on behalf of the president and his family when I say that we are very grateful to all, so many people from across this country who've expressed their concern at this act of violence. And finally, let me add our profound concern on behalf of two brave law enforcement officers who serve to protect the president. And then, of course, for a friend of everybody here, dedicated public servant Jim Brady. We're going to watch their progress with all our prayers, and with all our hopes. And now I'm going to walk over and speak briefly to Mrs. Reagan, who's returned to the, to the residence. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, the Vice President uh, being very brief and uh, no doubt expressing the uh, views of everybody. He says he is deeply heartened by the report on the uh, president's condition and then he went uh, he took pains to reassure the nation and as he said the world that the american government is functioning effectively that the officers of this government have performed their tasks with skill and care he expressed the gratitude of all concerned uh, for the outpouring of uh, sympathy for the uh, president and naturally to the profound concern uh, he expressed as he said he was sure speaking for the president and the members of his family for two brave law enforcement officers, both of whom were shot, one seriously wounded, the District of Columbia police officer, and a Secret Service agent who was uh, wounded today, who was in good condition, and also, of course, for Jim Brady, the White House press secretary, who is uh, in critical condition. So the report is optimistic about the president. It is not optimistic about Jim Brady. And Frank, uh, one final point, the Vice President making it very clear that the American government continues to function fully and effectively, and that message going out to friends and potential adversaries alike. We will be coming back with a special report two hours after we go off the air, that is at 10.30 Eastern Time, 9.30 Central, and then we'll be back again at 11.30 Eastern Time with more on Nightline, and of course we'll have bulletins as necessary should there be any late developments. This is Ted Koppel with Frank Reynolds. Thank you for being with us. This special report came from... And in theory, all of these things will work. But if theories and drawing boards were all that were necessary, there would be no such thing as test pilots. And that's exactly what Crippen and Young are on this mission. Test pilots. There are 34,000 of these tiles glued to the outside of the shuttle to protect it from the heat of the friction of the atmosphere on re-entry. No two of the tiles are exactly the same size or shape. Now these tiles have come loose in tests and during transport. NASA now believes that they will stay put. Well, this cockpit and the other crew spaces, and not just for Crippen and Young, but for uh, others, scientists and specialists who will be making other missions, is very cramped. And the reason, again, money. This is an orbiting truck, remember? And the bulk of the space is allocated to cargo. That's the meaning of payload. Landing one of these space shuttles isn't easy. I tried it in simulator some months ago, and several times I blew tires. I'm bringing the nose up a little bit so we don't build the speed up too much. Now, we want to anticipate this next turn so we don't have to turn back. That's right. Go ahead and roll back. Roll back and look at your pitch. Right. There's a 1,000 feet. Free player. You all right? Gear down. Wheels are coming down. No, just slowly. Don't rock and roll it. Okay. We're long, we're long. Uh -huh. well, we're running off the runway, but I'll tell you that. Oh, damn. I, did I hit too hard? Did I blow a tire again? Son of a gun, I'm rough on tires. <laughs> well, that was a simulation, of course. Right now, the real space shuttle, Columbia, is on launch pad 39A at Cape Canaveral in Florida. We'll go there in a moment for the latest information. 
And for a story told by Frank Reynolds about a moment of crisis faced by the crew and ground controllers of Apollo 13, which lifted off from that very same launch pad 11 years ago. That ordeal was a tough lesson in emergency responses for many of the same people who will control the shuttle mission. After this. Here at Houston, the controllers for the space shuttle mission have come on duty for the long night of the countdown to tomorrow's launch. Men and women have been guiding America's space efforts from here for 16 years. Our entire space program has been built on testing from the early missions of Mercury through Gemini to Apollo. Each project was built on knowledge gained from missions that went before. Sometimes they learned from trouble. My colleague Frank Reynolds is standing by at Cape Canaveral, Florida, where tonight the Space Shuttle Columbia, America's latest program, sits on pad 39A in its final countdown, moving closer to the next venture away from Earth. Frank, how do things stand at the moment? Hugh, the countdown was resumed late this afternoon after a planned hold of about 12 hours. Tonight, the three fuel cells in the orbiter have been activated, a check has been made of air-to-ground communications and tracking systems, and a backup astronaut will check all switches in the crew cockpit to make sure they're set just right. Although this is a new adventure, many of these same pre-flight checks were carried out before the launch of the Apollo spacecrafts. And it was 11 years ago this week that the Cape was in the same state of readiness for the launch of a space mission that did not turn out as expected, but did have a happy, almost miraculous ending. On that power transfer... April 11, 1970, Apollo 13 is ready for launch. It is the fifth time the United States will send men to the moon for the third time men plan to land there. Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert will attempt on Apollo 13 something never done before. Lovell and Hayes plan to land in the rocky lunar highlands, far from the relative safety of the flat lunar seas. All three are test pilots. They are used to danger. It's their life, and it's in their blood. They are among the best in the world. In the words of writer Tom Wolfe, they have the right stuff. Lovell, the spacecraft commander, America's most experienced astronaut. This will be his fourth trip into space, his second to the moon. Hayes pilot of the lunar module, Aquarius. He'd tested aircraft like the lifting body and flown contraptions like the lunar landing test vehicle. His colleagues consider him one of the most qualified astronauts ever. Swigert, pilot of the command module, Odyssey. He had tested the Regalo wing, a plan to land Gemini spacecraft by glider rather than parachute. NASA discarded that idea as too dangerous. He had been assigned to Apollo 13 only the day before. A replacement for Ken Mattingly, who'd been exposed to German measles. Swigert knows the command module like the back of his hand. He's written the book on what to do if things go wrong. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have lift off at 2.13. Saturn V, building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust, and it is clear the power. As Apollo 13 begins its journey, Lunar missions are thought routine, but the flight of Lovell, Hayes, and Swigert will bring them and the men and women of Apollo Control together in a moment of crisis. The beginning of the mission is routine, relaxed. As the astronauts start toward the moon, they turn the command module around and dock with the lunar module Aquarius. It's a complicated maneuver, but the astronauts are so confident, they broadcast the docking live back to Earth. Yeah, we're just about there. There is plenty of work to be done during the coast to the moon. The three parts of the Apollo spacecraft form a complicated machine, and each part has its job. The command module, Odyssey, is the astronauts' home. It will bring them to the moon and back to a landing on Earth. The service module carries the supplies for the round trip. Aquarius, the lunar module, will bring Lovell and Hayes to a landing on the lunar surface. The astronauts have systems to check, photographs to take, TV feeds to be made on schedule. But it is the men in mission control who do most of the work. They have the huge computers, the radar tracking devices, the teams of people who monitor every part of the spacecraft. It is the work of men like flight directors Gene Krantz and Glenn Lunney, controller Cy Liebergott, and capsule communicator Joe Kerwin that makes Apollo missions possible. 
Good morning, 13. Your spacecraft's in real good shape as far as we're concerned, Jim. We're bored to tears down here. Monday, April 13th. Apollo 13 is 180,000 miles from Earth. Three quarters of the way to the moon. Its speed is nearly a mile a second. Lovell and Hayes are checking out the lunar lander and giving a TV tour to anyone who cares to watch. But public interest has fallen off, and none of the networks carries the show. Apollo 13 will reach the moon tomorrow, and there are many small problems and details to attend to before the crew goes to bed. Okay, Jim, uh, it's been a real good TV show. Uh, we think we ought to conclude it from here now. Uh, what do you think? This is the crew of Apollo 13. We everybody there uh, nice evening, and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back for a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. One of the small things that needs attention is a problem Cy Liebergott, one of the experts for the command and service modules, has been nursing all evening. He has been having trouble finding out how much is left in one of the service module's tanks of super cold oxygen. It is one of the cryogenic tanks, or cryos, that provide the spacecraft with its oxygen, power, and water. To get a better reading, Liebergott needs the tank to be stirred. He doesn't know that inside that tank, a switch had fused shut during a routine test on the ground two weeks before liftoff. It had allowed the tank to overheat. And now, inside a tank of pure oxygen, the wires for its fans and heaters were bare. The insulation had melted. It is a bomb waiting to explode. And it can go off any time the tanks are stirred or heated. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to... Uh Stir up your cryo tank. Okay, stand by. Swigert hits the switch, and in the service module, four feet behind him, the fuse is lit. In seconds, the insulation is in flames. Bathed in pure oxygen, it burns furiously. The top of the tank blows off, and the tank becomes a blowtorch, spewing fire and hot gas inside the Apollo service module. Vital lines tear, valves slam shut, and the side of the service module blows off. Instantly, half of the astronaut's oxygen supply is gone. And within minutes, two of the three fuel cells that generate power and water will die. The astronauts don't know what has happened. They know they're in trouble. OK, Houston, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the uh, caution and warning there. Uh, to me, it was a shutter. It was a muffled shutter. All I really thought was, this is not normal, and it may be something very bad. There was doubt in our minds uh, exactly what caused the noise. Uh, nothing made sense, because what it, uh, what, it, what it said to me was that I had lost uh, oxygen tank number uh, uh, two, and oxygen tank one had a leak in it, and I had lost two fuel cells. For the next 15 minutes, the astronauts and the ground struggle to understand the problem and cope with it. In mission control, it seems impossible that something that serious could have happened at all. And at first, they think that their instruments are lying to them. We may have had an instrumentation problem, flight. Is there any uh, kind of leads we can give them? Are we looking at instrumentation? Have we got a real problem or what? It became fairly clear within oh, 30 minutes or so that we had a desperate situation on our hands. We were losing all the electrical power in the command service module and the breathing oxygen. And I look today, looking out the hatch, uh, that we are venting something. Or, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. We were losing oxygen from our breathing oxygen. Uh, okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. We're losing oxygen from our second and last bottle. It became very obvious to us that we were going to lose the mothership. Here is a bulletin from ABC News. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction that could cause the lunar landing mission to be terminated early. No lunar mission had ever failed, and Krantz and his team try everything. But the explosion has destroyed the service module's ability to generate power and water. And with that gone, the command module is slowly dying. The command module is the brain of the spacecraft. It has the computers, the guidance equipment. Only the command module can re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. But the service module is the heart. It carries the oxygen, power, and rocket fuel for the round trip to the moon. OK, now let's everybody keep cool. We got the uh, LEM still attached. The LEM spacecraft's good. So if we need uh, 
to get back home, we got Lem to do a good portion of it with. The only way to get home was to use the uh, lunar module as a lifeboat. The lunar module is a spacecraft all its own, but it was designed only to land on the moon. It carries supplies to last two men two days. Its rocket has half the power of the service module engine, and it was not designed to return to Earth. Somehow, the LEM supplies have to stretch to keep the men alive, and the LEM rocket has to do a job it was never meant to do, change course back to Earth. Getting back in Apollo 13, which a lot of people don't realize, was a series of milestones. We would overcome one obstacle, and then something, something else would, would crop up to give us a challenge, to try to make us figure out what to do. Without the ground help, uh, we never would have gotten back. No one is more aware of that dependence than the men in mission control. This is their ultimate test, but it is more than that. Three of their friends are in danger. He's satisfied that both of these tanks are going down and we're past helping them, even with batteries. That's what I'm getting at. I'm trying to be sure that you're satisfied that there's nothing else we can do. Our whole attitude was uh, we were going to do everything humanly possible to bring them back. But the astronauts can't turn around and come back. They've gone too far and are going too fast. They have to go around the moon. But their present course will take them far out into space. They have to change that course and use the moon's gravity like a slingshot to throw them back to Earth. It's called a free return course. If we could get back on that free return course to get us around the moon and back to the Earth, even though we intercepted the Earth, in a matter that uh, did not allow uh, ourselves to survive, I mean, a direct impact or something like that, it would be much better to end the mission in that manner than to be a permanent monument, you know, to the space program by orbiting the Earth forever. They have to use the lunar module's rocket, the one meant to land them on the moon. This maneuver has to work. If it doesn't work, there's almost no place else to go. And as most of you are aware, there is no rescue possible in space flight. The rocket burns only a short time, 31 seconds, and it puts them back on course for Earth. But it will take four days to reach the Earth, and their worries are only beginning. Four days is much longer than the LEM is designed to last. Will it have enough oxygen? Will it have enough water? Can batteries meant to last only two days be stretched to last twice that long? And the LEM can't bring them all the way home. Only the command module has a heat shield capable of withstanding the 5,000 degree heat of re-entry. But never has all power in a command module been turned off in the cold of space. And no one knows if it will ever work again. Tuesday, one day after the accident, Apollo 13 is behind the moon 250,000 miles from home. The ground decides to speed up the return and use the lunar module's rocket a second time. This time, the burn will last four and a half minutes and bring them back to Earth nine hours faster, heading them toward the Pacific, the only place in the world that recovery ships are stationed. The burn will use three quarters of the fuel they have left. Each of those procedures and maneuvers had to go right. And uh, we recognized the chance for, for something going wrong in any of the maneuvers was, was large. And, uh, but we were all test pilots. We'd all been in narrow situations before. This is another one of those. My attitude was one that we'd do everything possible right up to the very last bit. If we bought the farm after that, well, uh, we, we, we would go out knowing that we had done everything that we could do. Jim, you are go for the burn. Go for the burn. Roger, understand. Go for the burn. The burn works. And for the first time, the astronauts are on their way back to Earth. But in mission control, there is no time for congratulations. Many problems remain. Communication is difficult. The radio is drawing its minimum power. What I remember mostly during the long hours of return is sitting hunched over at the console with my headset on and the volume turned all the way up. And the, the voice contact with the crew would be an occasional thing, low in volume through a whole lot of hash and static. I didn't copy that Fred. Wednesday, 200,000 miles from home. As the astronauts watch the moon recede, they have turned off nearly everything. Only the radio and a fan to circulate air are left on. 
the entire spacecraft is operating on the power it would take to light three 100-watt bulbs. The spacecraft is dark and getting cold. The temperature here was about 38 degrees, but it was more than that. It was a clammy cold. It made sleeping very difficult. And what sleep you did was very restless. It was not good sleep. It is the first time since the accident that the astronauts have had a chance to sleep at all. Ironically, the astronauts make far more news for failing to reach the moon than they would have for landing successfully. People who know or care little for the machines that bring them there know what it means for those machines to fail and care about the men that fly them. Lord, your astronauts will come back safe. Mission Control is developing the plan to bring them back to Earth. If everything in the spacecraft remains off until the last possible minute, then, just before re-entry, the command module can be brought back to life using the power of three small re-entry batteries. There will be just enough power to last until splashdown. The plan is tested in simulators on the ground, and it should work if nothing more goes wrong. But something does go wrong. Apollo 13 is drifting off course. And if not corrected, they will miss the Earth entirely. Here is a special report from ABC News Space Headquarters in New York. ABC News Science Editor, Jules Bergman. Apollo 13 is now 160,000 miles from home. And Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert, in a beautiful piece of engineering piloting, are battling to keep their crippled spacecraft working. The all-critical event, that mid-course correction engine burn that must work, is now less than four hours off. On their present heading, they'd skip over the Earth, missing it by about 98 miles. The correction is a small one to change their speed less than six miles per hour. But that is the difference between life and death for the astronauts. They have to follow a very precise path to hit the Earth's atmosphere at the right angle. Too shallow, they will skip off and go back out into space. Too steep, and they will burn up on re-entry. It was literally flying by the seat of your pants. I had, uh, in the spacecraft, a... Uh a reticle or a gun sight that hung down in the window. We have two hand controllers for attitude. Uh, Fred has one, I had another. We got the earth in the window, maneuvered it around. Of course, everything is manual now, all the exotic autopilots and the guidance system, everything is off. So at the proper time, Jack said, start the burn. I pushed the button and the engine went on full blast immediately. And 14 seconds later, Jack said stop and we pushed the stop button and the engine stopped. And and after that, we waited. The ground radars soon tell them that the course correction has worked, but the spacecraft is still drifting. The whole procedure has to be repeated. It was a matter of having faith in the ground as far as what the maneuvers were. Uh, we, we had no, absolutely no guidance or navigation capability at this point, so uh, the solutions were strictly based on the ground track and uh, was really just follow the yellow uh, brick road. There is no yellow brick road for the men in mission control. Each new step has to be improvised every step of the way. And they have a deadline to meet. Apollo 13 will reach the Earth on Friday going 25,000 miles an hour. The astronauts have only one chance to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Thursday, 150,000 miles from home. The plan to bring the command module back to life is radioed up to the astronauts. It takes hours just to read it. And no one knows if the plan will work at all. The command module has gotten so cold that the ground fears the batteries may have frozen and the circuits may break as they warm up. Friday, the carrier Iwo Jima steams to the point in the South Pacific where it will wait for a capsule carrying three cold, tired men. Men who are not at all sure they'll make the appointment. Two and a half hours before re-entry, the command module is still dead. But when Swigert starts to turn on the power, the batteries work. The procedure is long and complicated, and things sometimes take more time than expected. The Earth kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you knew that you had limited time to accomplish all those tasks, to get everything done, because as we approached the Earth, we were going to hit that atmosphere, and you had one chance. Fred Hayes is sick. He has a fever of 104 and severe chills. He continues to work. Finally, it is time to cut loose the crippled service module. For the first time, the astronauts see the damage. And there's one whole side of that spacecraft missing. Is that right? It's really a mess.
Next, the astronauts pack up and move to the command module. The LEM, Aquarius, has saved their lives, but it is doomed to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere and must be jettisoned. Farewell, Aquarius, and we thank you. From now on, it is the command module on its own, and there are still uncertainties. The capsule is still drifting and may leave the re-entry corridor again. If we had, you know, somehow missed the Earth, drifted on by, uh, it was my intention that we would uh, remain alive as long as possible, uh, even though that our, the hope for survival was, was uh, uh, you know, lost, and that maybe towards the very end, we, all we had to do was to depressurize the spacecraft by, by opening up a vent and... Uh, you know, uh, we could have done ourselves in that manner. Even if the capsule enters perfectly, the astronauts and the ground fear that the heat shield may have cracked when the oxygen tank exploded. If it did, Lovell, Hayes, and Swigert will be dead within seconds of hitting the Earth's atmosphere. For several minutes, there is no word. The heat of re-entry blocks all communication. As the recovery helicopters take their stations, there is still no contact. In mission control, the wait seems to last forever. Long after they expect to hear from the astronauts, they hear only silence and static. Capcom, why don't you try and give them a call? Odyssey Houston is standing by, over. Okay, so... Okay, we read you, Jack. Visual contact, right? Apollo 13 was a failure, but in a more human sense, it was a triumph. A triumph of men over their machines, a triumph of the nerve, skill, and brains of the men of Apollo control, and three astronauts, Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigger, tested in a moment of crisis. And with me now is the man who first said those words, literally heard around the world. Houston, we've got a problem. Jim Lovell, the commander of Apollo 13. Jim, what did we learn from Apollo 13 in terms of men and machines and training and so forth? Well, I think we learned quite a bit, Frank. Number one, we learned that uh, everything doesn't work uh, the way you want it to work. We're all fallible to some degree. But two, we learned that we can come back from a potential catastrophe where just about everything goes wrong, and with the willpower and the knowledge and the skills from the ground and from the flight crew, we can get back safely. But it doesn't mean we can overcome anything at all, does it? I mean, but you were pretty close to the edge there. Well, we had to uh, leap over a series of uh, you know, hurdles to get yeah. back home. Uh, we just uh, finished one problem and another one would crop up. But it did give us the flexibility and, and sort of a sense of satisfaction to take something that was unusual and make a success out of it. Well, we discovered the outer limits of man and of the machines, too, didn't we? That's right, yeah, we...